Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you happen to find yourself in the world. My name is Carmen Mazera. I serve as Executive Director of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, or APSIA, to which all of your graduate programs belong. We're so glad to see all of you here today from all over the globe. And we're particularly delighted to welcome the team, both from the United Nations and the US State Department, to talk about the particular opportunities that careers at the UN provide. As we go through the conversation, if you have any technical issues, please feel free to send me a direct message. And if you have any questions about the content that you're gonna hear, please feel free to put those in the chat and we'll address questions as we can. And then particularly after the presentation, a chance to, to really tackle some of those issues. This session is being recorded and will live on the APSIA YouTube page afterwards. So if you say, oh my gosh, what was that great nugget of knowledge that I needed? It will be there for you after and your career offices will have that content so you can see back and refer back to them if you need it. This is one of a series of webinars that we do, so please do stay in touch with your career offices and they will let you know about the many other great opportunities that APSEA schools have, deliver content and opportunities for you to learn about the many career possibilities in international affairs. So again, hello and welcome, and I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Christina Sermon from the UN to kick us off. Christina, please. Thanks so much, Carmen, and thank you everyone for being here. It's great to see all the faces um, and still some in the waiting room uh, joining. So um, thank you all for being here. My name is Christina um, and I work at the UN Secretariat. I work on the uh, talent diversity and outreach team. So we work on diversity, equity and inclusion policies, as well as um, events like this to, to reach out to a diverse group um, of potential candidates to the UN. So I have a few slides for you here today um, and I won't take too long, but um, I do want to um, give you sort of an overview of some of our biggest, uh, some of our largest and strongest programs for um, youth for students and for graduate students as well. So um, all of them would are pertinent to you. Um, so without further ado, I'll start with just a, an overview um, of the UN Secretariat. And please don't be overwhelmed by the, the facts and figures on this slide. I mean, with your current studies, I'm sure you all know that the Secretariat just carries out the day-to-day of the UN as mandated by the General Assembly in areas of you know, peacekeeping, human rights, humanitarian affairs, among others, you know, like climate change and economic and social development. And what I would like to highlight here is just that the world looks to our organization for solutions to global problems. And in that, our organization is unique. So our people come from 193 member states and work for hundreds of departments and duty stations around the globe. So it means that we, by definition, work in multicultural teams alongside people from all professional backgrounds who have varying perspectives and experiences and approaches. And so ours is among the very few organizations in the world that are diverse, by design and by default. Um, and our people are our greatest asset. So we do want to make sure that the diversity and the complexity of, of this global UN presence is matched by a diverse and um, you know, geographically balanced, gender balanced, international multilingual workforce, right? To visibly demonstrate those core values. Um, and on this slide is just a few of our initiatives to that end towards building an inclusive workforce, um, including, you know, areas, but not, you know, not limited to all of these, but including geographical representation, gender parity, disability inclusion, um, anti-racism, youth, inclusion of youth and multilingualism, workplace mental health, and so much more. So um, there is a place for you here at the UN, um, and I encourage you to, to um, please apply if you, you know, connect with anything I'm sharing with you here today. The next slide is an overview of more practical information that I'm sure you're all dying to know. So um, entry points to the UN and job families. Um, there are a variety of different contract modalities available at the Secretariat, and you may choose among them, depending on your experience and your personal needs, because some might be more applicable than 
than others. So of course there are regular job openings and temporary job openings, um, which are often more flexible and kind of rapid tracks. Than, than the regular ones. Um, and there are internships and consultancies and the UNV, the UN Volunteers Program, which I'll speak to you more about, as well as the Young Professional Program. That's a big focus um, of my presentation today. And the Junior Professional Officer Program, which I'll just do a short overview because we actually have someone here from the State Department of the USA who will, um, Monica on the line, who will let you know all about it in more detail. So regardless of what you apply to, I do want to say that your work experience should be relevant to that position that you're applying to. So on the left-hand side here in the left corner, there are generally the minimum number of relevant years of work experience that you should have after the completion of a master's level or equivalent degree. If you do not hold a master's and you just hold a bachelor's, then you would add two years to the the minimums that you see here. Um, and of course, each job opening on the website will outline the details and you can take a look. And we do have job openings in each of those job families on the right hand side. So um, I know you probably resonate um, with some of them more than the others, but in case you didn't know, yes, we do have, um, you know, a science network at the UN and information into te telecommunication technology and, and um, you know, we have pilots and engineers and civil engineers and all kinds of different stuff, right? So um, please do take a look. I encourage you to, to explore all of these options on our careers portal. You can see the link down there in the right hand corner. Um, of this slide. So without further ado, let me talk to you a little bit about some of these entry points that I mentioned. I'll start with the internships. Um, the internships are one of the most common ways of starting a career at the UN. Um, the application periods, you know, depend on that department or division. Sometimes they get filled quicker, other times it's slower. Um, sometimes it's at least two months often so don't please don't give up uh, too quickly um, and keep checking in so you're after you you know go through the application process the selection and the interview the internship dates are agreed to by you and your hiring manager so it wouldn't be identical for each intern um, in terms of requirements you know Grades are great, um, but we also look for well-rounded individuals. Um, of course, a good grasp of English um, or French as our official working language, and any of the other official UN languages are also an asset. Those would be Arabic, Chinese, French, Russian, and Spanish. And um, you know, all these internship opportunities are also at that career portal um, that I just mentioned earlier. And I just want to encourage you, if you do apply, don't apply just for one, apply for as many as are relevant to you. Please cast a wide net um, as this will increase your chances of being selected, of course. Um, and just a few notes here um, uh, for eligibility reasons. You do have to be in your last year of study. To, to be eligible to do an internship. So it doesn't have to be after you're done studying, it could be a part-time internship if that hiring manager is agreeable to it, but you do have to be in your last year of studies. The minimum time range that you have to commit to is two months and it can be extended up to a, a maximum of six months. And um, one thing to note, of course, is that internships at the Secretariat are currently unpaid. Um, we are working on improving that and, and you know, making a stipend uh, uh, for interns, but at the moment they are unpaid. You might be able to do it remotely if you're not in New York, um, and that, that has allowed some of our interns to um, definitely get their foot in the door this way. Um, but that, that was the last point I wanted to mention there. Um, and of course, if the internship criteria doesn't apply to you or you would like to go for a paid opportunity, there are a number of options available. So I'll go into that next. The first one is the UN volunteers um, that I'll speak about that's a paid opportunity. And this might seem um, confusing at first because you know when I, before I joined the UN, I had no idea that the United Nations volunteers actually have stipends and benefits. So um, that's something I definitely want to highlight here. So 
The UN volunteers were established as a development partner for the UN system with the mandate of deploying these volunteers um, across the world. So you can see here, there are tons of, of, of options. Um, most fall under that specialist category that you see in the top right hand corner. Um, a lot of them are community volunteers and I believe 10% actually are youth volunteers. And a, a recent kind of category is the online volunteers that you see on there. It's more informal. Your tasks can be completed over the internet. Um, and, you know, the education criteria varies, right? So for some of them, you might need a bachelor. For some, you don't really need more than a high school um, diploma. And as for benefits, yes, volunteers are supported by a comprehensive package. Um, they have like an entry lump sum that they receive travel tickets if they're, if they're um, appointed somewhere else than where their permanent address is. They have a monthly living stipend, insurance, um, you know, vacation days, um, and so on and so forth. So if this is an interest to you, the link is down there at the bottom for you to check out opportunities. And they also have kind of like a calculator to get an estimate of the, the benefits and the financial compensation there. So that was the human volunteers. And next I'll go into the young professionals program, which this one's near and dear to my heart because I'm a young professional program um, finalist myself. So there was a video there, but in the interest of time, I'll skip it and you'll have access to all these slides um, afterwards. I'll make sure to share them as well. So um, I'll start with the application and, and the whole kind of recruitment process overview for um, young professional programs. So um, before I go too far into this, I do want to note that the YPP, as we call it for short, is one of the unique programs in the Secretariat in that it is open only to nationals of un or underrepresented member states in the UN. And there is an age limit as well. So just setting the stage here to kind of emphasize that this is a specific program with some additional criteria that you might not find in regular job openings. Um, and so I'll go over all of that next. But first, just a quick overview of the process. There's an application stage, of course. You can read about the program on our website right now. You can determine your eligibility from the list there, and then you would apply in our application portal called Inspira. Um, once your application is screened, you would be invited to an online exam. That's called the assessment stage. Um, it could be uh, one or two exams, and then a virtual interview with a panel. Um, and when you are invited to that assessment stage, you'll receive resources, you know, reading materials, early access to the testing platform to check it out, sample questions. So you will have um, sort of a package to help you prepare yourself. Um, and just keep in mind that the UN doesn't charge any fees at any point in this process. So just be aware of for-profit companies offering services that are not necessarily endorsed by the organization. Um, I know when I was applying, I came across a few of those and I almost um, spent a couple hundred dollars for something that wouldn't have even been official advice. So just putting that out there. Um, and then finally, just a quick note about that third stage, the roster stage. It's, it's really the definition of success in the YPP, although it is different from the success you might expect in applying to a traditional job opening, right? So those that are successful in the YPP are placed on this roster, this list of successful candidates that is then used to fill vacancies over the course of three years. So it's not really about applying to the YPP and being placed immediately in a job opening. It's more about investing in your future career at the UN, if that's something you're interested in, and keeping the door open for you to be able to to you know, enter this professional level uh, environment. And in my case, um, I did apply back in 2018. I applied in the summer of that year. And over the course of the next 10, 11 months, I did take two exams online and then a panel interview. And then on the, I believe the 11th month, I was notified that I did make it on this roster. So it took almost a year for that process. And from that time, it took two, about two and a half years for me to be placed with this team that you see me here with today. 
Um, that, of course, was a little longer because the pandemic happened in the middle of, of uh, me being on that roster. So there were hiring freezes and, and whatnot. But um, just setting the tone here to not expect it to be sort of an immediate um, you know, um, next step. But it is something that is truly fulfilling. And from my own perspective, I'm, I'm hoping that this is the beginning of a long and, and fruitful career with the UN. So just going into the eligibility criteria a little bit, like I promised, um, I did mention the nationality bit. So you must hold a nationality in a particular, a, uh, a particular selected member state that is un or underrepresented. Um, and for this year, there are 60 participating countries. I'll show them to you in the next slide. And you'll also find them online at that link on the bottom. Um, and then only individuals that are 32 years old and younger are able to participate because this program, like I mentioned, was introduced as a way to rejuvenate the workforce of the UN and to just help improve geographical representation balance in the workforce. So that's truly where the nationality and the age criteria come in, as those are specifically the mandate of this program. And then we have education, which is just the first level university degree in an area that's you know, relevant to the exam. Um, and each year there are different subject areas that are included in the exams. And you'll see that online, you'll see which um, degrees are accepted for which exams. So you can cross reference what you have um, on your you know, uh, university degree or expected university degree with the list. Um, and then language is the fourth eligibility criteria. You would need fluency in either English or French as the two official working languages. So one note here is to please, please, please indicate fluency there um, when you apply. Some people get shy and say proficient. That won't cut it. You might get screened out. You will get screened out by the system and your application will never reach an actual human's eyes. So please indicate fluency. Um, we've had this kind of, uh, we've noticed this trend. So we do want your application to be considered if you, if you send that in. And just a quick takeaway, there is no previous work experience required for the YPP. Um, if you have it, it's a plus. Of course, if you have a master's on top of your bachelor, it's a plus. But the, the fact that this is meant for young professionals, um, makes it different from the other job openings you might find at the UN. And last but not least, some practical information for this cycle. And I do want to say that this session today is very, very timely um, as the YPP has just opened two weeks ago. The applications are accepted once a year. They've opened two weeks ago and they go through the 31st of December. Um, so you have one and a half more months there that they're open and they're open in these two exam areas, legal affairs and library and information. So um, please take advantage of this. Go ahead and check out your eligibility online. Um, there's an FAQ page on there as well, important updates, you know, all kinds of information. And if you do have questions, I will be around at the end to answer them um, from my perspective as a YPP. I forgot to mention, but I am, I did apply with my American nationality. I was originally born in Romania. I have dual citizenship and Romania was on, was not on the list, but the U.S. was. So that is how I applied and how many of you could probably apply. I believe um, at least maybe half of you are um, have the American nationality. And if not, if you do have a nationality in the list here, I encourage you to, to go ahead and submit an application. So that's it for the YPP. Um, I'll do a really brief overview of the JPO from the perspective of, of us as the UN Secretariat um, staffing diversity and outreach team. But like I mentioned, I will pass it over to Monica to go into the JPO program from the perspective of the United States um, State Department. Uh, from, you know, just a quick overview, the main objective of this program is to provide young professionals, again, with the opportunity to gain hands-on experience in multilateral international cooperation. Um, and this is different than the YPP in that the junior professional officers are sponsored by and um, sort of recruited by their country of nationality. 
So uh, it is sponsored by some of those governments that you see here listed um, towards the bottom of the page. Um, for most donor countries, they sponsor a two-year uh, appointment to a job in the United Nations. Um, but some countries have flexibility to extend their JPO period. Um, some countries uh, that are listed here are donor countries, but they actually sponsor some uh, young professionals from developing countries. So do check that out as well. If, you're, if you have a nationality from a developing country, it might be that one of these countries sponsors you. And of course, the recruitment process and eligibility criteria here is not as clear cut because it does vary from country to country. Um, I won't go into all of them on that list, of course, but I will pass it over to uh, Monica so that you can hear about the JPO program directly from a State Department perspective. And before I do that, I'll just Leave the slide up for a second. Um, if you wanted to follow our UN Careers team on social media at all, if you want to check out that career portal, the link is there at the bottom again. Um, I do encourage you to sign up for our talent pool. In the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a bit.ly link and also a QR code. That talent pool is a um, it's your way of showing interest in this type of content and potentially being uh, contacted about opportunities that might be relevant to your uh, background. So you don't have to put a CV or anything. It takes less than two minutes. It's a really quick form and you might be contacted about, um, like I said, opportunities that might be relevant to you. And if you want to hear more from us, we do have a, uh, a big uh, live stream on YouTube coming up next Monday. It will be 8 a.m. Uh, New York time, so might be too early for some of you, but we'll have a replay. So um, please go ahead and, and check out our social media so you can get the link to register for that as well. Um, we'll cover some of this content in a little bit more. So if you're interested, um, keep up with us and um, I'll be around for questions at the end. Thank you so much. Back to you, Carmen. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. And now I'm delighted to turn the floor over to Monica Cummings from the State Department. Thank you so much, Carmen. And Christina, I really um, appreciate going after you because you did such a thorough and comprehensive overview of the various options within the UN system. Um, and the US, so our, my role is I'm, I'm at State Department. I'm a career foreign service officer. And one of the things that we've been focused on uh, in the International Organizations Bureau is getting more Americans interested in careers within the United Nations system. And not just at the UN Secretariat, but in all of the other UN agencies. One of the ways we've been doing that is actually through the promotion of the JPO program. So the Junior Professional Officer Program, and I believe Alistair uh, dropped a link in the chat to um, a series of one pagers that we have put together to recruit for this position. So um, there are a very limited number that um, have been funded by the US government uh, just writ large. And then um, there are certain organizations and bureaus within, say, the Department of D Defense or the Department of State that fund um, position, JPO positions at specific organizations. But um, I really appreciated Christina's outlining the importance of this program and how it's a developmental program for young professionals that gives them the opportunity to have a career within the United Nations system. So the idea is that the United States, we get funding from Congress to uh, fund the position for the first two years. And oftentimes, I think there it's like a 90% retention rate for those individuals working to stay on with their organization or their agency within the UN system. So it's a really a strong pathway for um, developing a career within the UN system. And so um, the eligibility, uh, again, as Christina outlined, it's you, have, you cannot be over 32 years of age and must have a work experience as well as a bachelor's or a master's degree. Um, and the deadline for applications every year is December 31st um, for, of the year of application. So 
uh, taking advantage of opportunities that are posted over the course of the year. Um, so that is really uh, one in which uh, reaching out to um, reaching out to you know finding the program that you're interested in. Um, it's it's a great it's a great opportunity to really start those careers um, within the UN system. So I um, also am happy to talk a little bit about the foreign service as a as a career because it's an alternate to working in multilateral diplomacy. So I have I've been a career foreign service officer for the last 20, 22 years, and I have worked um, at our missions to the UN in New York, as well as our mission to the United Nations offices in Geneva, and now in our home bureau of international organizations. And so in the, you know, as a career foreign service officer focused on multilateral diplomacy, you're able to represent the United States at these organizations and work with other, get a lot of experience in terms of negotiation and working on uh, a broad, broad range of uh, issues and challenges that are cross cutting, you know, around the world. And so it's a really wonderful opportunity. And so I would encourage everyone to also consider the Foreign Service as an opportunity to do that. And, you know, uh, for JPO candidates and, and for work, a career within the United Nations system, you really do need, um, you know, to have that second language coming on board. But State Department uh, will often train you in the language that you will need in order to have a fulfilling career and, and serve overseas. So um, I, I want to put that plug in um, for those for those opportunities. So um, I will leave it there because I think that, you know, I'd like to open the floor up to questions because I think um, that's that's where some of the more valuable back and forth is and you get to ask exactly what you're interested in, so. Many thanks to you both. Um, I'm seeing some great questions in the chat and I invite others who, who have questions. This is your prime time to get your information. So, so please use it. Um, for those of you who have been asking, yes, the recording will be available afterwards and I promise you'll get the link. And if you can't find it uh, for some strange reason, it will be at youtube.com slash AppsiaTube as soon as I can get it up there. The first question that I have uh, here in the chat is, um, a broad question, Christina, for you about why the subject areas for the YPP change from year to year. Yes, thank you. I could see that one. Um, so that's a really good question. It's it's to the same extent that the, the geographical uh, representation changes year to year and the eligible countries change year to year. That's sort of the same idea there is we will do an analysis of the um, workforce capabilities and the skills that we need and and we are you know most lacking and then we open the YPP exams in those areas. So it's an intersection of you know youth being hired, geographically diverse youth being hired and to fit those those true needs of in terms of workforce capabilities for the future UN. Um, so that is why they change year to year. Thank you. Could you also talk about consultancies and how those generally work? I can, I would love to. I actually, um, sometimes we do a slide on this. I didn't know if I should do it in the interest of time. Um, if you want, I can, I can share that right now if you think that's okay. Um, Carmen, let me know. Sure. I saw that that was, it's a, this is a common entry point as well. So um, it's just a really quick slide um, on that. Um, so consultants um, at the UN are, um, you wouldn't believe how many people say they, they were started in, in the UN as a short-term consultant. So um, this is truly individual contracts to work on short-term projects. Um, they, the consultants would be a recognized authority or specialist in a specific field, and they would be engaged by the organization in sort of an advisory capacity, right, um, on a results-oriented project or to analyze some problem or to direct the seminar, it's, it's often very short term um, and very, very specific. Um, so 
if you are an expert in your field, if you do have the relevant experience and you are available for a short-term assignment, you can actually register for the consultant roster, the list of consultants. Just provide your um, personal history profile, which is the, the UN's version of your CV, your resume, um, and then mark that you're available for consideration when opportunities arise. Um, and that way you are kind of on this evergreen list that, that um, our hiring managers reach out to. And your location of assignment, I should note, it could be at various UN duty stations or at any of the regional or country uh, project offices around the world. So um, you would be contacted for consideration whenever relevant opportunities come up um, and invited to, you know, um, interview or continue with the recruitment process that way. Or you can actually find consultancy openings on our job portal and just apply yourself um, in, you know, I don't know. I would suggest doing both <laughs> if you're interested in doing both. Um, put yourself on the roster and apply to specific openings. Um, but yes, consultants are they're uh, remunerated. They uh, you know they're part of the organization for a short time, and then oftentimes they end up networking and and being retained by the organization and staying in. So um, it's also a very good entry point. You noted they should be a recognized authority. So typically that would be someone not early in their career, but a little more mid to later in the journey. Exactly. And there are junior consultancies as well. You'll see those marked on the career portal. So if you do, if you are earlier in your career journey, you can look for those as well. They're less um, common, but if you do find one, it's a good one to apply to. Thank you. And I do see a hand raised, but I wanna to get to the questions in the chat just to make sure we, we have enough time. Um, Monica, this one's for you. Is it recommended that American citizens have a career or extensive experience in the Foreign Service before pursuing a career in multilateral diplomacy? That's a great question. Um, so American citizens can have, uh, you know, like if you're pursuing a career in the Foreign Service, you can take the exam at any time. Um, I joined right after school, but many people start in the foreign service as a second or a third career and get a, a, you know additional experience uh you know overseas or mm -hmm. as lawyers and you know or doing consulting work and but they bring that those skill sets to the table so and often that's very valuable experience that they have um before joining the foreign service um as well as you know getting a career in multilateral diplomacy. I would add that if you look at the qualifications for many of these programs that we were just talking about, um, there are sort of age limits. So, you know, like the JPO, uh, you have to be under 32 years of age in order to, to apply. Um, and as well as the YPP has a, I believe has a limitation on age as well. It's also 32. So, um, there are yes you can you know get some career and experience outside and you bring that in to the department um or into the your career is at the un thanks to, to build on that and related to another question i have here um can you talk about the kinds of experiences that competitive jpo candidates typically bring in and what helps them stand out in a good way as you're reviewing applications Yes, no, that's a um, also a great follow up just to so they look at um, a wide range of experience that people are, you know, what the needs are um, for the various UN agencies. So um, I believe last year UN Information Center uh, actually came to us and said that they wanted someone they were looking to hire someone focused on disinformation. And so we funded a for a, you know, an individual like an individual spot that would focus on that, um, and then there were I, I don't recall how many applications there were, but a very large number of applications for that one spot that was 
available and um, they go through a competitive process to hire um, and the resumes are, are evaluated. I was not part of the process on that one, so I c couldn't break it down, um, but I do know it's a competitive process and they consider a wide range of qualifications for every individual. And again, these are specific, you know, it's, it's a career track. So someone who has specific experience um, in, you know, technical skills, um, be it for the, you know, like a, we also have a JPO um, that I met with when I was in Vienna earlier this year, uh, who's at the UN uh, Organization for the Outer, the Peaceful Uses of uh, Outer Space. And, you know, a very specific technical agency um, that has a lot of potential for someone to have a, a great career and, yeah. So it's a wide range of things that are appealing to individuals that bring in those technical skills. So we have, we have a lot of students doing space policy, so all of you can, can head there. Christina, a few technical questions. Can you talk about the start dates for internships, particularly relevant to the closing of the postings? If a student wanted to, to intern in summer 23, when should they apply? That is a very, very good question, actually, and I'm, I'm so glad you asked. I actually have a few colleagues here from the team also on the line that have been helping answer questions in the chat, and um, they're also here live, of course, and maybe I'll pass this one over to Pina, if you don't mind. Um, maybe you could take the question from Sarah on internship start dates. Sure. Thanks, Christina, and thanks, Sarah, for the question. Um, basically, um, internships are available on an ongoing basis in the UN Secretariat. So um, when you see an opening right now, but you're more interested in uh, starting your internship next summer, if you feel that the opening is quite interesting and an area you would like to actually do an internship, I would suggest that you still submit your application because it could be that um, uh, there is like a need for, for some interns right now, but there could still be a need for interns um, later on uh, next year. So uh, it's not so rigid in that sense. So I suggest that you're basically uh, considering if it's something that interests you where you would like to get some practical experience and then apply and uh, maybe in your application you can always um, indicate your availability dates right you can say like I'm available in the summer next year for an internship and it would be my preferred um, time period to to complete it. So that's all also very clear what your expectations are and that just helps the, the UN to, to understand uh, what you're looking for. Great, thank you. Monica, one more question for you and Leonard, thank you for being patient. Um, Monica, can someone add a JPO position if they're working as a Pathways intern or later on if they're an FTE at State? Yeah, that's a yes. Um, I so working at state does not disqualify you from applying to and pursuing the JPO uh, program. In fact, it may give you very useful experience that you can be transferred over from working at state or another U.S. government agency to uh, the UN system. And so, um, and you know, we. We really uh, appreciate the values of accountability and transparency and good governance within the UN system. And those are all values that US government employees are, are held to account for. So uh, I think that that can be very useful. Hi, um, I was wondering if I could clarify my question. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, you know, I'm extremely interested in working at state and the UN. I was just trying to clarify the logistics of if I'm you know, a Pathways intern, or if I'm already converted to an FTE, uh, if I do the JPO position, any uh, potential to come back to state? I know for some employees who uh, are in detail may be able to come back. So I was clarifying if there'd be feasibility with that and JPO as well. You know what? I would have to check on that. Um, if I would have to check on that and get back to you, um, I'm sure there is a, a way for, you know, to make that happen. Um, and it wouldn't, it, yeah, but I, I wouldn't want to confirm something that I'm not 100% certain of. So 
um, I can take that and get back to you. Great, thank you. Monica, to build on that broadly, the application process for being a JPO, you talked about you know, identifying a particular need. Where do applications go and who broadly does the review? So that's a really um, interesting process because we have a new office at State Department in the IO Bureau. It's the Multilateral Strategy and Personnel Office, and they are the ones who are looking at, they, first of all, they sort of do a um, canvas of, you know, where the needs are and what the priorities are um, within the UN agencies that we would want to fund um, because there are a limited number, there's a limited pot of money that Congress allocates for this funding. And so we have to look first and foremost at what the strategic priorities are for placing US citizens within these uh, positions in the United Nations. And so, um, so that's the first step. Um, once they've identified those positions and sort of secured the funding for those, then they put out the call for applications. And then there's an office within State Department that um, looks at those applications. And I don't I don't know the all of the mechanics of that process. Um, so I wouldn't want to get too far ahead of myself there. But um, that is sort of the broad outlines of how it works. Um, and last year was my first year working on. No, last year was my first year sort of um, being on this side within the bureau and and looking to see how that call went for. Um, yeah. So. And Christina and Pina, is that similar of other governments? So my colleagues who are not U.S. citizens who might be looking to their own government, is it a similar process? I'd actually maybe invite So Jong at this point to, to share her experience because she's a GPO currently working with our team um, from the Republic of Korea. So not from the US, but experience is, is relevant regardless. So Jong, do you want to share about your um, GPO application experience? Yeah, sure. So yes, I'm a I'm a JPO currently um, from Republic of Korea, and the the hiring process um, varies across countries. So in my case, it was uh, the the announcement was on the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Republic of Korea, and then I applied through um, the application system, UN application system. Um, and then the Korean government did the first screening um, and the final selection, um, the interview and the final selection was done by the UN hiring entity. So um, it's, it really depends on the donor countries. So um, yeah, I, I recommend you to check with the government of your own nationality. And so young, if you don't mind, um, what have you enjoyed about being a JPO or what's the experience been like for you? So um, the most outstanding thing about JPO program is the training elements um, uh, on top of the hands-on experience. So um, JPOs have a dedicated training budget as well. Um, so um, on top of um, your work like you're you're fully engaged in the work um just as the same as a, a the staff member but also at the same time you have the opportunity to um do any type of training you know like internal or ex external training um and you're subsidized for external training as well so um, I think it's it's what's really um, like advantages um, of being a JPO. Um, and another thing is a JPO network. So um, JPO program is administered by DESA, UN DESA. Um, and there is an international network of JPOs. Um, so I not only get to um, work with my own team members, but also I get to network with uh, JPOs from all around the world. 
And um, so after the JPO program, what's different from YPP is that um, um, you have to find um, a new job opportunity at the UN. And I believe that like this uh, networking opportunity is really instrumental to find a, uh, a position later um, after the, the after finishing the JPO mission. Thank you so much. Christina, we have another technical question about the application process and looking at the application materials that would need to be submitted. Could you talk about the formatting for things like resume? Would it be a US federal style? Would it be a CV style? How, how best does that come forward? Definitely, I saw that one in the chat and um, it, was, it was too much to, to type it out. So um, that's a great question. I, it, um, the resume format is not exactly a federal resume type format. I, it's, it's called the candidate profile in the United Nations system of online applications, which is called Inspira. So you would be actually building sort of your resume within this system. You wouldn't just be attaching a file. Um, you would be sort of going in and really thinking about your experience, professional and personal, your motivation statement, your uh, degrees and certificates, um, and other educational experience, um, even anything you've published, there's fields in there to enter all of it. So um, once you do it once, of course, it's the system saves it, but um, yeah, it's not just a drag and drop of your standard resume, it's, it's the candidate profile, which you have to build inside our, our um, online portal. This again to remind you for folks who weren't able to join us, we'll have a session specifically about YPP as well and that great opportunity coming up in just a few weeks. Noting that our, our time is running out, I'm curious, Monica, Christine, they, all of our colleagues here from the UN, is there advice you would have for students to really make sure they stand out in a positive way? Um, and something that you particularly noted about your own application experience that you think students should take away from this? I love this question. We do this um, in our regular events, just going around the table and sharing the best piece of advice. So um, I don't know if maybe anyone else would like to start or I can go first. <laughs> um, so from my personal experience, um, I have, you know, one main piece of advice, which is apply and don't select yourself out by not applying. Um, and I used to, to hear it said that, you know, you can apply a hundred times and you'll receive 99 no's, but then you'll get that one yes. Um, and so please don't be discouraged. Keep applying many times. Um, you would not believe the amount of applications I had in Inspira and many people apply for the YPP multiple times, you know, until they turn 32 and they make it on the second try or the third or whatever it may be. So um, yeah, my, and especially, you know, for women, I would say definitely don't discount yourself, um, apply for the job and um, have confidence in yourself. Yeah I, can, yeah, I can also give my um, tip. So um, in every job description, like we, what we call terms of reference, um, you'll find the several core competencies uh, related to the job. Um, so when you get to have a chance to have an interview with the UN, you'll be asked, um, you'll go through the competency-based interview. Um, so um, instead of just listing uh, what you have done previously, um, really linking your um, core competencies um, with your per uh, demonstrating um, your co core competencies um, by your previous experience um, and the skills you have developed uh, would be um, very um, effective to show your uh, match with the, with the job. Thank you. Pina, any bits of advice? Maybe just to add, um, prepare yourself very well. Um, think about what um, you would like to get out of an application or a possible position in the UN. Um, sometimes that's difficult to imagine when you are at the beginning of your career, but I know that some of you probably have some really clear ideas of um, 
what you would like to to be and where you can protect yourself. And I think that's a very, very important skill. Um, and it's something that should um, transpire a bit in your application because it's interesting to understand um, you know, a bit your red threat um, in, in your in your uh, career so far in your studies, maybe you had some some professional experience, some internships that you did, some consultancy opportunities. So um, even let's say maybe a PhD um, experience, this is all very relevant and very important. So it's, 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 I think, very advisable to be um, be prepared. Read a lot um, about the UN. Uh, how where you could maybe see yourself and make a contribution, and be very specific in your application. As Sajan said, like um, try to look at the competencies and integrate them in your um, in your basically application profile. Um, is it for the YPP or for a specific um, position? I think that is that is a key sort of element that that will be received very well by the recipients of your application. Thank you. All right, Christian, since you promised it's a short question, you get the last piece of advice to draw out. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you guys for we really appreciate this. Uh, it's a lot of information. Um, and getting it from the source is great. Uh, I just had a quick question about the examination areas uh, again. Um, so would you suggest if the exam, I know it changes every year, would you suggest waiting if you're not interested in uh, the certain examination area that's being offered this year? Or would you suggest applying and then if you happen to get in, um, potentially moving around within the UN system, if that's how easy is that, if that's uh, even an option? That's a wonderful question. So maybe I can start from the YPP perspective. And if anyone wants to hear about moving around in the UN system, maybe Tina, since this is my first appointment and I haven't moved yet, <laughs> um, I'll open it up to you then. Um, thank you, Kristen. So um, the aside from being an area that you're interested in, the YPP exam area also has to be relevant to what you're studying. And I just dropped in the chat two links, one for legal affairs and one for library information management where you can really see the list of all the um, degrees that are accepted for that exam area. So um, aside from being something you're interested in, please do check that you it's actually on the list um, that is considered relevant. Um, and regarding waiting, I do think that that depends on your personal circumstances, right? So it could depend on how old you are and when you're turning 32 or um, whether your country of nationality will be on this list of un and underrepresented countries next year um, and whether you will be eligible you know, next year or the next time around. So um, that's more of a personal question, but in terms of getting your foot in the door and moving around, I've heard nothing but wonderful things um, about our mobility um, in different job areas or geographical areas anyways. So um, I, maybe I can let Tina uh, elaborate a little bit on that. No, I totally agree with you, Christine. I think that's um, that's a good way you, 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 um, you pointed it out. Um, maybe just in addition, just to give you an example, Christian, like Christina is a YPP in our team and she has been placed on a specific YPP roster for like that is that is linked to a job network and job family, but we have it in this in the same team uh, an, another YPP who is not here unfortunately today because uh, he's not feeling very well. But um, he has been placed on a different um, job network, and they they end up both in the same team. So I think the future also of the UN and teams will be very much um, with different backgrounds. The specialization is important and needed, but I think this transversal skill set. Um, flexible skill set is, is absolutely key for future, let's say, the future workforce of, of the United Nations. We we spoke a little bit, Christina spoke a little bit about the diversity at the UN, so diversity of backgrounds and different disciplines working together on a common problem is such a, an added value uh, that we would like to foster more and more. So um, from that perspective, um, it's also another you know, point you can consider um, before you submit your application. And, um, and yeah, exactly, there's great mobility, mobility programs, which is 
will this year have a new, let's say, overall staff mobility program that will be launched also on a voluntary basis. And um, while it still remains quite competitive, even um, let's say within the organization, because you often have to apply, um, it's it's um, it's still there's still a lot of opportunities um, for you to move around, and it is even something I would suggest that you feel quite comfortable possibly doing um, along your career in the UN uh, because it will just you know benefit you and your um, involvement in your career to, to be able to, to be mobile. Thank you so much. Christina, the last word is yours. I can't believe we forgot to share this, but it's actually encouraged for YPPs to be mobile. There's a, after your initial two-year assignment, there's a managed reassignment program, which is basically um, an official name for an exercise where you move to a different duty station or a different department and try out just so that you can improve your breadth of experience. So um, yeah, that's that's a huge one and it's coming up for me soon. So I can't believe I forgot about it, but definitely if that factors into your decision about applying, to, uh, definitely consider that as well. Pina, I think it means she doesn't wanna leave your team. She's just blocked out the, the possibility of leaving. Well, thank you so much to all of our colleagues for joining us and especially to our UN folks for, for speaking and sharing these many opportunities. If you are a US citizen, I hope you will check out the US specific JPO positions. And if your country is on the list of others that sponsor JPOs to seek those out. I wanna particularly thank our colleagues at the UN Information Center of the US for co-sponsoring this event with us and arranging such a knowledgeable and wonderful panel. Have a great rest of your day, everyone, and please do stay in touch for upcoming APSIA webinars uh, so that we can continue to help you build out your professional life. Thanks. Take care.